I want to talk about this neighborhood. I want to talk about this neighborhood in which this story is set, what it means to you, and what it means to your creative collaborator, Terrell McRaney. So describe this world and how you came to bring it to the screen and what it means to you. Yeah, so uh, Liberty City uh, is the neighborhood in Miami where myself and Terrell uh, grew up. It's kind of like the Compton or South Central uh, of LA. It's sort of the same neighborhood uh, in Miami. Um, and it's interesting because I don't talk about being from there uh, a lot. And so not a lot of people knew that aspect of my uh, biography. Uh, and Terrell McCraney, who's a MacArthur genius uh, playwright, uh, he grew up in the same place. And so uh, when he was graduating from DePaul uh, undergrad in 2003 uh, as an acting uh, fellow, he was applying to the Yale School of Drama as a playwright. And he had to do a, a writing sample or a work sample. And so he wrote this play in Moonlight Black Boys Look Blue. Um, and 10 years later, uh, it, it landed on my doorstep, I like to say, in my inbox, I guess, since it's 2013. And, uh, and it was really beautiful because when it came to me, uh, the line was, this isn't about you, uh, but it's about you. And what my friends meant, these two guys in Miami who knew both myself and Terrell, uh, was that they knew about this aspect of my biography where uh, my mom was addicted to crack cocaine. And I don't talk about that very much. Uh, and here's Terrell McCraney, MacArthur playwright. His mom was addicted to crack cocaine. And so these guys thought, well, we should get these two guys together and have them make a film about that. Uh, and that was how it came to me. I want to talk about the first time that you guys started talking about this project specifically. What were those initial conversations and what were the obstacles to turning this play into a screenplay? Um, well, I think that, uh, as I was telling you before, Barry and I started talking about this project in context of a few different ideas of what could be his um, sophomore film and eventually settled on this one. And what I liked about it, and I think it took Barry a minute to figure this out, was that it was a deeply personal story to Barry, even though it was an adaptation of somebody else's work that was autobiographical. That's both promising and perilous, isn't it? Well, it, it, well, it, it, it kind of happened the way it had to happen. Oh. Uh, because like she said, I thought it wasn't personal. I thought I would just hide behind Terrell. You know, it's, it's not my mom, it's his mom. Right. Uh, but in the course of, uh, of writing this thing, because originally I was going to give Terrell these very structured notes as a director on what I wanted to make uh, as a film, as a director. Um, but he became a MacArthur genius in the process of doing this and got way too damn busy um, to actually do the writing. Uh, but it was beautiful because in those like four, five, six months, we basically expressed to each other what we thought you know, the, the filmed version of this thing could be. Was that scary to you? Uh, which part? Just to go and revisit that part of your life that maybe you didn't talk about it and didn't share. Uh, it was, and that's why, again, I thought I could hide behind Terrell. I wasn't revisiting my life, I was revisiting right. his life. But when he went away. But then, but then he went away, exactly. <laughs> uh, and I went to Brussels, Belgium to write the, the first draft, uh -huh. and uh, I wrote it in 10 days because without Terrell there, uh, I mean, the first draft, I mean, what you just saw is definitely not uh, <laughs> the first draft. Uh, but uh, it just came pouring out of me because I, w I realized, or I didn't realize, I was putting myself fully uh, into it. Jeremy, this fine man was moderating a Q&A at the Telluride Film Festival for a movie that you worked on called 12 Years a Slave, correct? Yeah. And I mean, something happened there that kind of got us to this place. Yeah, I mean, it does have, there is a prior chapter, which is, um, has anyone seen Medicine for Melancholy, Barry's first film? Yeah. Thank you, person right there. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm a massive fan of that film. I, I love that film. And um, one of the things I remember about that film, um, and I think we see it again in, in Moonlight, is, is the, the sort of luminosity of it, the luminous beauty of Medicine for Melancholy. And yet, that is the, somehow the delivery system for a lot of things that are not always beautiful and, and, and str some strife and conflict. So, uh, like, a, you know, was very captivated by that film and, and wanted very much to work with Barry, and we, we traded some projects. Uh, my partner and Didi and, and Plan B's our company and tried to find ways to work with Barry. And, you know, as sometimes happens, you, you know, you trade ideas and you talk about stuff and, and you know, you don't lock in on the one. Right. And then, you know, uh, I guess, yeah, 2013, uh, we were at the Telluride Film Festival with 12 Years a Slave, and either like right outside the first public screening or, or, I th or you know like an hour before or something ran into Barry and it was like reconnected and it was lovely to see him again and th sort of through that experience we got a chance to start talking again about other things and um, around the time I guess shortly after the time I believe when when Adela and Barry had resolved that that this adaptation of In Moonlight Black Boys Look Blue was going to be the film 
um, you know, we started to trade some material and, and we got a copy, Barry sent us Moonlight, which as a reader was a really memorable experience. Uh, I think the film that you just saw is, um, um, you know, some very, very unique combination of, of something quite epic, something quite um, grand in its ambitions and, and in its desire to speak to like, you know, universals of human experience and, you know, questions of how we grow in time and what happens between the cuts and things like that. And yet for that, it sacrifices none of the um, intimacy and, and tenderness and, and, and it's un, un, unashamed and, and incredibly brave about, about its emotional depth and, and what it's going for emotionally. And the script had those qualities and um, we, uh, we just said that we would like to try and be involved and, and luckily for us, Dale and Barry, um, you know, welcomed uh, Plan B into the equation and, and here we are. And here is an amazing group of actors as well and <laughs> and you all should know, Janelle, this is your first acting role in a movie, right? Yes. So it's a big part. Uh, I'd love to hear like how this story project came to you and what your initial interests slash concerns were about playing Teresa. Sure. Well, I studied acting. I went to the American Musical and Dramatics Academy in New York City, fresh out of high school. I've always wanted to be in film, but I had not read the right script until I read Moonlight. Barry Jenkins, I always tell you that script Oh, it changed my life. I was, I, I said, I have to be a part of this. I dropped everything that I was doing. And I said that this is a story that we need. This is fresh. It is, it's raw. It's emotional. And when I read for Teresa, instantly I felt connected to her because I knew women in my community who were nurturers just like Teresa. You know, when I was going through things, I had that younger aunt or the older cousin who I could go talk to, and they wouldn't judge me. They were there, there to support me through hard and difficult times. And the most important thing that I wanted uh, to, to, to make sure came across was when people saw this young boy going through all these uh, different stages in their lives, if they could look at their lives and when they see young people that they know who may be going through something similar, the other, the outcast, the one who was oftentimes bullied or discriminated against because of their sexual orientation or the color of their skin or th their gender, if they came in contact with that person, Teresa is an example of how you treat them. Naomi, what were your reservations and how did Barry uh, work you through those concerns? Um, my reservations were twofold, really. Um, first of all, I have always um, tried to... I think as an actor, you don't have very much power in the sense that you're not producing the material, you're not writing it, you're not editing it. And um, so I think one of the few areas where you really do have power is in your choices. So I think in choices are incredibly important. And I've always been very careful in my choices because... I was raised by a very strong, intelligent, capable um, woman, uh, my mother, who I really respect and admire, and I want to represent women like that. So I've always thought I want to portray positive uh, images of women in general, and black women in particular, and I drew the line at crack addiction. <laughs> and then I got presented with this incredible <laughs> script, <laughs> which sent me into a tailspin. And um, so that was one of my dilemmas. And then the other thing was, I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. I don't even drink coffee. So I was wondering how I go from me, a uh, Miss Teetotal, to full-blown crack addiction. Um, and I was really apprehensive about taking that on board. Um, and then I spoke to Barry, and if ever you're unsure about anything, don't speak to Barry because he'll persuade <laughs> you of anything and make you believe that you can achieve anything as well, which is a wonderful quality in a director. And he just basically explained to me that this part was, you know, the story, his mother's story, and he wanted to tell his story and his story necessarily involved that of his mother. And I realized that here was someone who had, um, who was emotionally invested in ensuring that this character wasn't a cliche, wasn't a stereotype, but was given the full humanity and emotional depth that she deserves. Thank you. 
Travante, there's something in the casting of Little Back, Little and Black and Chiron that is consistent to me and maybe to the audience in terms of the way you see the world through your eyes, the way you look at other people, the what you take in, what you share through your eyes. So I have a kind of a logistical question before we get to a couple of scenes. Is that did you have a chance to to talk with Alex Hibbert and Ashton Sanders about about their work, or were you guys all shooting so out of sequence you never even actually met them? Barry was actually quite adamant about not allowing us to <laughs> okay. see. Andre and I both were kind of trying to find some semblance <laughs> of what the younger versions were doing, whether it be a walk or the way right. that they carried their head or held a fork, whatever it may be. But Barry was really adamant about not allowing us to do that because he didn't want us to focus on mimicking what the right. younger versions were doing. And he really wanted to show that throughout our lives we change so drastically depending on what happens to us. And this person is someone who went through so much that I guess casting three different people really had to uh, push that through. Barry, I'm going to ask you the last question. And then, was there a moment in production or watching this movie that was hard for you to watch and do? And do you remember what scene that might have been? Yeah, I mean, I, everything working with Naomi uh, was very difficult because, you know, here's these things I've compartmentalized or, or even just buried. Um, and, and now, in, in the ramp up to, to production, I kind of felt like this was going to happen, but that's an intellectual thing. Right. But then when you're on set um, and this person, this beast of a person, <laughs> Uh, is, is fully embodying uh, your mother. Uh, it's a very intense thing. And so there, there were things we did with Naomi that I didn't think I would do until I was in the moment. And in the courtyard, when Ashton is, comes home from Teresa's, and she's like, but I'm your mama, ain't I? And she looks right at the audience. You know, we had filmed the scene, OTS, OTS, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then I said to Naomi, because I felt like that, that's a moment of transference, where this kid is realizing for the first time, as you guys realize for the first time, his mom's this other person, and I wanted you to feel what that feels like. And so this is, I, I, I love you, because she's on set for an hour, the inspector is opening worldwide, she just came from Mexico City, and I go, Miss Harris, could you do that looking right into the camera? Didn't warn her at all. She goes, yes, Barry, I did it all the time on 28 days, let's do it. You know, I only wanted the line, but I'm your mama, ain't I? But we do it, and Naomi, she's a beast, she just keeps going. And she walks off, and James walks off with her. And they go all the way to the front door. And now I'm like, I'm in this kid's body. Oh we flip God. around, we do it on Ashton, and I'm like, okay, I got a movie, you know? Be be because, because when I feel these things move me, I can go, hey, crew, I have been moved. Let's all be moved. And they're like, yes, let's fucking be moved. <laughs> and, and, and the whole process of making this film was that way for me. That's a great story. 